Hello, my guest this week is a cryptocurrency journalist. She stresses her independence from any particular faction and says she holds no crypto assets herself. She's written, by her own admission, hundreds of stories about crypto, covering everything from NFTs to missing crypto scams. I'm delighted to welcome from the United States, Amy Castor. Hi, Amy. Hi, Charles. How are you? Very well, and thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Miller. Well, now, I, I wanted to start by seeing if we can put everything in perspective a bit, because uh, the world of BTC in particular has been going crazy over the past few months in terms of valuations. Uh, mm -hmm. It was only last September BTC was worth about $10,000, and then it's, it's recently touched $60,000. How would you rate where we are now in terms of, uh, uh, will, we, will we look back on this as a big moment, do you think? Um, yeah, I think so, because, um, you know, Bitcoin has never been this high and there's just a lot going on, a lot of um, money, a lot of institutional buying in the space. So um, a lot of this stuff about NFTs and um, a lot going on with Tether, there's just a whole bunch of stuff going on right now. Could we characterize this as some sort of coming of age or being accepted by the financial establishment or something like that, would you say? Um, I, I, it's hard for me to think of it as coming of age or an acceptance. I think there's a, a big rush to try, of uh, people trying to make money in the space. Um, I, I see Bitcoin mainly as a, a speculative investment that's it people are kind of running in in the hopes that it'll kind of go up higher whether they can make money about make money out of it somehow so yeah i mean it's always been thought that uh bitcoin or btc at least its best hope for a sort of long-term future would be that it acted as some kind of counter cyclical financial asset and yet strangely when the Nasdaq and the S&P go up, it seems to go up and, and vice versa. So that particular role uh, doesn't seem to be working. It, it does make you wonder really what the point of it is, whether it's just a speculative asset. I can't think of it being anything else. <laughs> There's no, you know, it has no intrinsic value. So it's it's just based on you buy it, and then if you can you can sell it for a higher price, then you're lucky. If um, you happen to be, it's all about calling the top, just like in 2017. You know, um, some people made money if they got out in time, but many people didn't. Uh, a lot of retail people lost uh, a good bit of money when the price started crashing, and I think we'll we'll see that again. The the I mean, this is a bubble. Um, the bubble is going to pop and it's it's all a matter of, of calling the top. It's sort of like a game of musical chairs, you know, and there's not going to be a lot of places to sit when the music stops. So people are going to, some people are going to lose their shirts. Yeah, sadly. Well, you've spent quite a lot of time covering one area where there's a sort of interface between billions of dollars and Bitcoin, which is Tether. If you're trying to interest readers in the the trials and tribulations of Tether, they have to be pretty into it to to really get the story because it's so complex. Yeah, a lot of things about cryptocurrency tend to be very complex. So it's hard for people on the outside to sort of understand all the things that are going on. And I, I think what happens is I've been reading about it for so long. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to switch gears when you explain it elsewhere. So most of the people that read my blog probably know a little bit about cryptocurrency. Um, so I don't explain everything. So I, I kind of take the middle road and I have to assume that some people already know kind of what's going on with Tether or, or crypto. I mean, you are not, as I said at the beginning, um, allied with any any particular faction within this world of crypto. 
Would you describe yourself as a crypto skeptic? Oh yeah, I'm a skeptic. I mean, I think when I first got involved in the scape, in the, when I first got involved in the space, I, I sort of thought the technology was cool. And you know, I was in Cambridge and I was sitting in a classes at MIT and trying to learn as much as possible because I didn't really come from a technical background, like say another Bitcoin skeptic like David Gerard or um, George Stolfi in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> so I was kind of getting up to speed on that. Uh, but as I learned more. Then and I understood the different money flows. Um, then I became more critical of that, and I sort of pulled away. There was a time when I was writing for different crypto publications, and I, uh, I at some point, I just sort of gave up on that and just said, I'm just going to write what I want to write for my blog. And I think it's the times when I was writing just for myself that I would get the most attention. You know, <laughs> like when I would publish my. Uh, quadriga timeline you know all of a sudden I was getting calls from BBC and you know so um, so it it seems like when I was just mostly true to myself is when my stories would get the most attention you know and I I stopped caring you know would it be easier to make a living as a crypto journalist if you were not so skeptical in some ways I suppose you know um, because um, there certainly are more moneyed opportunities for people that write about crypto in a positive light. Um, and so in that sense, financially, it would be easier, but I, I don't think I could, I just, it's not me. I'm just not comfortable with that. I, you know, I'd rather go out in the backyard and eat worms and <laughs> be, be, be write about, you know, how I, how I see the world. So, you know, and for me, for me, the writing and researching, you know, I tend to be a bit of an obsessive personality. So I just, I just get obsessed and I just spend like literally all day reading about, about crypto. And it's funny because no matter how much you read and study it, you never, you know, I always feel like there's just so much more <laughs> I could dig into. So um, it's sort of like a hobby and an ob obsession and just something that I actually think is fun. Um, but I wouldn't say that I'm, you know, making a lot of money. Sometimes financially, it can be a struggle, to be honest. Um, so just just going back a little bit, you mentioned you were at MIT. Um, what what were you doing there? And how did you get into all this as a, as a journalist? Well, it, it's very easy to sit on sit in on classes at MIT. So I, I lived close to um, MIT. So they would have classes on blockchain. Now, this is going back a few years because I haven't been there in a while, but you know. Were you studying something else then? Or? No, no, I, I would just go sit on the classes like Silvio McCauley, who, who launched the Algorand blockchain. He had a whole class on that. And sometimes uh, Gary Gensler would teach courses at MIT Sloan. And I would just go in and sit on the classes and any and other things that they had going on there as a way to kind of get up to speed. So you would just happen to be living nearby and just popped in for some lectures? Just ride my bike down there and, and walk in, you know, and sometimes I'd bring my dog. That's great. Well, could you have, could you have wandered in and uh, done an exam and got a degree like that, do you think? No, no. But they're, they've been, you know, I'm I've never had problems sitting in a class and talk to right. the instructor and they, they wouldn't mind, you know. But so were you already doing journalism at that point? I mean, did your did your crypto journalism come out of an existing career in journalism or did you go into journalism because? Of oh, I, no, I was always I was always writing. I think how I slipped into crypto was that I was doing some uh, marketing writing. Um, and then I just became very interested and it just I, I I always preferred doing more news journalism stories than writing uh, marketing content, which was just boring to me. I'd done that for a lot of years, and I was just bored to tears, bored to tears. But, so coming at this subject from, if anything, a, a skeptical uh, view, is it difficult to get information out of people when you are known for that? Presumably, people are not particularly willing to to help and give you a lot of information. Well, um, no, that's not true. I, I have connections to all the Bitcoin skeptics. You know, um, I've become good friends with like 
David Girard, and and he's been like a mentor to me because he had been writing about um, Scientology and Bitcoin for ages, you know. So um, there's there's a support group of people that are Bitcoin skeptics that are happy to feed you information, happy to help explain things. Um, so I have a lot of contacts all throughout crypto of of people I can reach out to and talk to. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to write a story, I don't need to always quote somebody. I mean, I just wrote a story on, you know, mobile coin and uh, most of that stuff is already on the Internet. <laughs> you just have to know where to find it, you know. <laughs> um I know that you you mentioned Quadriga, and I know that you and David Gerard are featuring in a forthcoming uh, CBC documentary about the Quadriga story, um, uh, which which sounds amazing. I mean, I've I've read a little bit about that story. Now that is an incredible. It's more like a thriller. And you know, I was talking about how hard it might be to explain Tether. Well, here's a lovely story in terms of drama and incident and color and stuff compared to your your average crypto story isn't it yeah and i there's another documentary coming i can't tell you anything about it but you know that's not the only the cbc documentary isn't the only one there were a lot of um oh a lot of people working on quadriga stories and and i think this year we'll start to see those stories come out so that'll be interesting and yes it was it is a thriller, and and people would always ask me, so what makes Quadriga so interesting? And it's a fact that it was a crypto exchange in Canada. It was the largest crypto exchange in Canada, and that was a high trust society. And and people just assumed that it was a safe place to put their money. They weren't asking a lot of questions, and I don't think that people really understood until some of these um, reports came out from Ernst and Young and the OSC about what was really going on behind the scenes. And I think that's another thing that makes Quadriga so fascinating is that we kind of have this window to what was happening inside. And it was almost like as bad as you imagined that it might have been, it was like way worse. <laughs> For people who haven't been following this, the, the story revolves around the founder going to India on his honeymoon and dying uh, apparently in India and uh, taking with him the information that was required to access all the money that people had in the exchange. I mean, that's sort of the bare bones of it, I think, isn't it? Well, that was the initial narrative that came out of, of Quadriga it was the exchange sort of went belly up. And the story that they were pushing forward was that, hey, Gerald Cotton, our CEO, it just died unexpectedly, and um, gosh, he had all the, the the keys to the cold wallets. But as the story developed, and as we learned more, there was no money in the cold wallets. He barely ever used cold wallets, and he just sort of gambled all the money away or spent it on things. It was just like his own private stash. I mean, he was a uh, a con going way back, and he just was like, "Oh my God, all this money! <laughs> I can do what I want with it," you know. But I mean, after he disappeared, a, a group of people who'd lost out formed a kind of investigative group, I believe, and um, compiled a whole lot of information. I was wondering, what is it like being a, a sort of single one person journalism operation uh, when you're kind of in competition with a whole group of people like that who are following the same story? Or was that actually a help to you? I don't. I don't think it was a competition. I think that that the people were, who were doing some, uh, like one person, one fellow that we refer to as Q, um, who did a lot of research on data and, and tracking the money flows, he was very happy to share that information. And then, and then it was just a matter of kind of turning that into a story and explaining it to people in a way that made sense. You know, so that's more of what I would do as a journalist is just sort of go out and 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 collect this information and then work with people to kind of say, OK, how's this story sound? Is this is this what's happening? And then create this sort of drama storybook around it. Is there still an unsolved mystery about Quadriga? Are there still big stories to, to come, do you think? 
Oh, yes, I do. I think so. I think the biggest question is, you know, did Gerald Cotton really die? Or was this just, you know, the exit scam of the century? I don't, I, I, I really have a tough time believing that he's, he, he is, he is truly dead, you know. Um, uh, Quadriga operated itself as a Ponzi scheme and, and Ponzi's uh, will either sort of, they, they, they just sort of become a bigger and bigger problem for the person managing it. <laughs> and, and then with, with Quadriga, it was sort of doomed to failure early on and it was just a matter of time. And in, in, in 2018, it was just falling apart and people couldn't get their money out. It was becoming clear that the money wasn't there. And from then on, Gerald really had two choices. One choice was that he could just turn himself in because they were going to catch up to him eventually, or he could disappear. And I think he just disappeared, you know. But it's your conclusion then that the whole of Quadriga was started with bad intentions it's not just something that went yes, wrong yes i do uh, oh absolutely i think it was started with bad intentions and and some of the reports that have come out i've shown he, he was sort of creating alias accounts fake accounts and on the exchange you know from the get-go so way back early on and don't forget he was he was a con artist um from the time he was 16 that was all he ever did was sort of take people's money and he had no qualms about it so it was sort of he got involved with Quadriga and, and this was just, wow, people are giving me a lot of money, more money than I've ever seen before, you know? So I, I think he sort of always, it was just by the seat of his pants though. You know, sometimes people think that these people that run these Ponzi's are really clever. I don't, I think what's clever is sort of the disguise, the face they put on to the rest of the world, which is sort of amazing. You know, um, you know, like Bernie Madoff, you know, how he could just <laughs> continue with that lie day after day and and not have it bother him. Um, so that's sort of the clever part. Part of what put people off the scent, perhaps, was that this kind of thing doesn't normally happen in Canada or we don't think of it as happening in Canada. Well, there actually is a lot of money laundering in Canada, but it's a high trust society. And and people expected that that there would be some oversight on this exchange or that, um, you know, I think Canadians also tend to be fairly trustworthy, you know. Unfortunately, um, stories of people being scammed, uh, money laundering, using crypto to buy drugs, it's all part of a whole collection of things that people who are not interested in crypto Maybe maybe all that they've heard of about it is is bad news or sort of disreputable things. And one sort of school of thought about that is, oh, well, look at the early days of the Internet. It was all pornography and horrible stuff going on. And that this is just the sort of the the pioneers and that eventually the, the, the well-organized and respectable people will take over. What's your view of that kind of thing? Uh, I don't. I I I I, will, I have a little trouble with that comparison that, that Bitcoin or blockchain is like the internet because I think early on people understood that the internet had it was going to had a it was going to serve this this purpose and they understood the value of that. But with Bitcoin, it's never really been clear. It was it never really worked. It was supposed to be like a an e payment system. It never worked out for that. And now it's become this store of value where people sort of are are betting the price is just going to go up and up and up. So, um, and, and I think there is, you know, the, 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 the cryptocurrency space is just rife with fraud and scam. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, I, it's just how it is. So, you know. <laughs> that's good for journalism anyway. That's the angle I come at it from, you know, okay. <laughs> you got to um, follow the money. I don't know whether you, how much you know about what we, CoinGeek is a, a news site that basically supports Bitcoin SV. And yes. strangely, um, a lot of the things that you complain about are things that we also would would want to completely separate ourselves from. And as you say, micropayments, for instance, is one of the strengths uh, in the, the potential of Bitcoin SV. Um, have you, I mean, ha have you come across Bitcoin SV and what, what sort of a reputation does it have in, in these circles? Um, you know, Charles, to be honest with you, I really haven't looked 
into Bitcoin SV a lot. Um, it's just not something I've been researching lately. I mean, I know it's a fork of Bitcoin. I don't know how widely it is used or how easy it is to um, trade on various exchanges because what's made Bitcoin and Ether so popular is because you can easily convert those into cash on Coinbase or whatever on these banked exchanges. So I don't really know a lot about that. I mean, the things that I tend to be focused on lately is is mainly Tether. And now I've sort of focused on NFTs, that that market, because I'm, I'm trying to write a book, even though it's a slow, <laughs> slow process. Um, so I've been really, really focused on that lately. Would your skepticism um, perhaps be um, be less if you were persuaded that Bitcoin SV is um, encouraging startups to do things like make microtransactions, to store data, and all sorts of uh, other uses that it, that it really is banking on being um, useful rather than uh, a, a currency that's for, for any kind of speculation. Is that the kind of thing you'd like to see in this sector? Um, what would I like to see in this sector? Um, I, you know, I, that's, it's, it, I don't have an answer to that because there's, there's, what I would like to see in the, the sector is more regulation. I would like to see some of the things um, you know, I, I I think that what I don't like seeing is frauds and scams and 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 sort of bad people get away with things and they're not you know they're not held accountable. I think that's what bothers me and that's what kind of you know um, is why I I do so much reading and writing because I I. It's just something that I care about. Regulation is one of the favorite subjects in Bitcoin SV circles, and people are talking to Congress people and so on. So, and also members of the European Union regulatory uh, task forces and so on. So, again, I think we're right um, onto that one. Um, but I just want to ask you about NFTs, because as you say, you're writing a book about NFTs. Um, presumably, you think but in a few months' time, they will still be of some significance rather than... You know, it's so, it is so hard to say. It's, it's, it's so hard to predict how long these things will continue for. It's so hard to predict how long Tether will go on for. It's so hard to predict how long these NFTs will be exciting for. I mean, it, it, it's always like, I'm thinking about them like, oh my God, this, is, this bubble is going to blow up you know, tomorrow. So I really need to write a little bit faster. <laughs> but it could, it could go on for, uh, you know, a long time for all we know. So um, it's very hard to predict those things. But, but eventually, I think the problem with NFTs is they're going to run up against certain uh, regulations and stuff. So it's not your position that the, the whole idea of an NFT is just another way of extracting money from people and that they're not really buying anything. I think NFTs are sort of like a, a pump and dump. No, there's nothing that I can see on NFTs that, you know, I mean, you can you can have a piece of art, you can go into different NFT marketplaces and make multiple NFTs off the same piece of art. You can be somebody and, and create an NFT based on somebody else of, else's artwork. I mean, there's a whole issue of, of, you know, basically the only thing that's on NFTs, these non-fungible tokens, is they're just pointers to something else on the web. And sometimes that something else may not be there when you want it to be. <laughs> and you could have an NFT that points to, to nothing. So there's nothing that I can see that's really of value inside that NFT itself. It's mostly, again, people buying these thinking that they are going to be able to resell them. And a lot of the people that that mint NFTs, these artists come in and they see this gusher of money going around and, and people buying NFTs for ridiculous amounts of Ether. So they then buy Ether so they can mint an NFT and they become an advocate for cryptocurrency as a whole. So it's really 
a boon for crypto, these NFTs, because it's it's bringing, it's created a lot of excitement around cryptocurrency. More people are reading about cryptocurrencies and um, more people are speculating on NFTs. And to do that, oftentimes you have to buy into crypto to do that. But so the message of your book really is going to be, um, you know, why are these people being so stupid and putting all this money into these NFTs? Um, well, that's only one chapter <laughs> explaining why they do it. People put money into things because people are seduced by the idea of, of these get rich quick schemes. You know, they see people and how his life has changed like virtually overnight. He only got into this stuff in mid October is when he first started reading about it and he dropped his first NFT, uh, NFTs on Nifty Gateway. And October 30th. And, you know, how many months has that been? And now, you know, he can he can book a private jet, he can do whatever he wants. I mean, he's just got, you know, life changing uh, uh, amount of money, millions, you know, and, and this is a guy who, who at times would sell his work for as low as like 100 bucks. Yeah, in a way, though, weird, um, modern art that people who are not in the art world think couldn't possibly be worth uh, what people are paying for it is just part of the course. That's that's part of that world anyway, isn't it? Well, that's one way to look at it. But, but with Beeple, I mean, he would create each of these images. I mean, it would take him a couple hours and some of them were just initial sketch. That whole every day, the reason he created those images one a day was a way for him to just practice. He was just practicing. It's like if I got up every mm. morning and just you know, as soon as I opened my eyes, just, you know, typed up whatever came to my mind, because I'm practicing my writing. And then and then, you know, seven and 13 years later, I'm going to sell you my <laughs> the guy who bought it, uh, he completely understood that. And he said, Well, you know, this is so great, because what I'm buying is a depiction of his learning process. And you can see that he's got better over the years. And it's a sort of uh, a representation of his determination to become a better artist, and he had a he had a kind of rationale beyond just saying, "Oh, well, the early ones aren't very good." Well, I don't know. To me, sixty nine million dollars seems like a lot of money to pay yeah, for no, that. I, you know, I it, completely to, to agree. To pay for a JPEG, but uh, you know, hey, that's just me. I don't have that kind of money to throw around to begin with. Okay, so let's just end on a forward-looking note. Um, do you think, I mean, if things go well in the world of crypto, what kind of a, a sector will it be in, say, five years' time? I mean, what, what's the most optimistic view that, that you can visualize as to where this all is all going? I think eventually the, the regulations will catch up to everything that's going on right now. And even, you know, Bitcoin will probably still be around, but I don't think it will be valued at much at all, you know. Um, so you don't think it'll be really a, a big industry anymore? No, I don't. I think that, that um, the regulators eventually will step in and they'll just sort of strangle these exchanges and these places where cryptocurrency is traded. And um, and once that liquidity go is gone and once Tether is gone, you know, once Tether is taken care of properly, um, there's just not going to be a lot of life left in, in Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency in general. Well, that is a view shared by many people who support Bitcoin SV, actually. W uh, accept that they think that Bitcoin SV is going to is going to be the one thing that is left standing after all this. Um, so, um, if you'll allow me, I'm going to send you some stuff about Bitcoin SV that will give okay. you an optimistic view of the future. <laughs> oh, thank <laughs> you, Charles. Thank you very much, Amy. It's been really great talking to you. Well, really thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> have a good day. Thanks very much to Amy Castor. And you can find a lot of Amy's work on her own website, amycaster.com, as well as in other publications. It's interesting how little disagreement there is between someone who calls themselves a cryptocurrency skeptic 
and probably most people who support Bitcoin SV. We'll see how that works out in the months and years to come. Thanks very much for listening and please join me, Charles Miller, again next week for another CoinGeek conversation. Till then, goodbye. as a whole is worth billions of dollars. But for a sector with immense value, iGaming is plagued by issues with data protection, digital security, and high transaction fees. Integrating iGaming with Bitcoin SV blockchain makes transparency and verifiability core components of the industry. Businesses can reduce friction in integration, licensing, and digital marketing, and reduce operating expenses. BSV allows complete transaction visibility and instant payment on every bet made. Using BSV tokens lowers money transmitter fees. The iGaming industry can operate at scale on Bitcoin SV's stable and secure platform. Learn more about building your iGaming business on the BSV blockchain.